So I'll never forget when I went to college, my parents, pretty much everyone said, oh, wait for it. You're going to gain the freshman 15. You know what that is? It's like when you go to college and all of a sudden you can go to eat the cafeteria and everyone gains 15 pounds. You know, and, and so, and parents love that kind of thing because they just pay like the meal plan and then they can eat as much as they want to eat. So I heard about this for a long, long time and, you know, and being all Italian from the East Coast, everyone's like, listen, you know, once you start to, to bulge out, it's never going to stop. So, so, that, so I was getting a good hard time and I remember I got to college. Now, being all Italian from New Jersey, I was raised by people who really did a great job of cooking. So like in my family growing up, uh, food is a love language. So like, you know, my, when you see my grandma, she feeds you. My dad tells this story when he wanted to marry my mom. He had to go meet my mom's grandmother, who would be my great-grandma, who we knew as Nani. And, and my dad, Nani kept giving him food. My dad was all tiny, so he just kept eating it. And after he left the house, he went down the block, he threw up. You know, I'm like, dad, that's nasty. He's like, but it was so good. I didn't mind eating all of it, but I couldn't keep it in anymore. So, so food was a love language when I grew up. And so like literally you grow up, you know, my mom, she could cook, you know, my grandma, she could cook. Every aunt, uncle, every family member who I wasn't really sure if they were a family member, all of them could cook, right? And, and so then I go to college and sure enough, it's like, okay, the freshman 15, I walk in and there's like this buffet of food and like the chicken was rubbery. The meatloaf was, had like a green tint to it a little bit. And it, and it kind of freaked me out like a lot, you know, because I remember thinking like, this is not what this stuff's supposed to taste like. So I had a bright idea. I was going to become a vegetarian. Now, I didn't do it for social reasons. This was long before hipsters were anti, you know, industrial food complex and stuff. It's like, I just didn't want to eat meat that was not meat-like. And so I remember when, when I went home for my first break from college, you know, my grandma was just like, what is this that I hear that you have become a vegetarian? What is wrong with you? You know what I mean? And I'm like, well, grandma, you don't understand. I mean, like, you know, you and mom, you guys cook so well and it's just amazing. Everything tastes like it's perfect. Like you never have to eat out. And, and then I went to college and she started laughing. She's like, oh, everything's nasty, huh? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. And she's like, we can fix that. I'm like, oh yeah? She's like, I'm gonna teach you how to cook. So I thought to myself, this is a good idea. I mean, I'm a single guy. If I know how to cook and I'm kind of handsome, you know, I got a college degree. I might have a shot here, you know? <laughs> and and so, so I'm like, okay, grandma, you got it. And so me and my grandma, we sit on down and, and, and my grandma's like, the first thing you need to know how to make is you know how to make sauce because you're Italian. And so everything goes good in sauce. So she's like, and so she, she's starting to show me how to make this thing, right? And so I, and I'm making it and she's like talking me through it. And it's really beautiful because my grandma, I mean, she's an Italian grandma. So she doesn't, she's not working off a recipe book. She's not measuring anything out. You know, half the time she's eating what's in the pot. And she's like, mom, needs a little more of this. It was totally gross, unsanitary, but it tastes delicious, you know? And so, so sure enough, my grandma, we, we made my first pot of sauce, but it's not quite right. It's not perfect. And so I'm eating it, and, and like I grew up, literally, my grandma's sauce was so good that we would walk into the kitchen, and we would take bread, and we'd throw it into the sauce thing, like literally from across the room. Because if you got it in there, then you had to go fish it out. You had to eat the bread with the sauce dripping all over it. It was so awesome, you know? So my grandma literally, and then she's like run after you with the wooden spoon. It was a beautiful life, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, so, and so I tasted it. I'm like, Grandma, it's missing something. Grandma, what's it missing? And she got a big smile on her face. She's like, ah, oh, I forgot to tell you the most important ingredient. You got to put a lot of love in it. And she got this big smile on her face, and she gave me a big sauce bread kiss right on the side of my face, you know. And she gave me a big hug, and she said, oh, I love you. And she gave me this big warm hug. And I've never forgotten that story because in a lot of ways, that's the key to an extraordinary life. I mean, if you think about life, like, so, like, like I had to write this book, Upward, Inward, and Outward, because I wanted to write a book about life, a life that we're all living. And can we make sure that we get the right ingredients there? Right? I mean, like a good sauce, you need the right ingredients. You need, your, you need your basil and you need your garlic and you need your olive oil and you need your salt if you really like it that way and sugar if you don't know how to really make a sauce. No, I'm just kidding. I know that's a big thing right now. Like, do you, are you supposed to put sugar in the Italian sauce? We can talk about that later and talk about the acidity of the, of the tomatoes and does it really need sugar or we just like sweet tooth and all this stuff. Anyway. So if you want to have an amazing life, and I believe that you do, because it's the only life that you get to have here, so it's like you better get it right. 
You need the right ingredients. But even if you have all the right ingredients, if you don't have a lot of love in it, it's not going to be an extraordinary life. And what's beautiful about this is that we've learned that from Jesus. Why? Because when they asked Jesus what the greatest commandment was, Jesus said, you need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And you need to love your neighbor as you as yourselves, as you implied, as you love yourself. That's where we get upward, inward, and outward from, right? Like upward is loving God, and then inward is loving yourself because God loves you. And then outward, you live out from all of that love out into the world. But upward, inward, and outward, I like to say that the art of living is loving. Love is the ingredient. Like you can have everything in your life together. You can have health. You, you know, you can have a, a good family that you came from. You can have a career that you find fulfilling. You can have all these ingredients. But if you do not have a ton of love in the midst of that life, it might be a good life, but it's not an extraordinary life. So I wanted to make sure that as we're kind of breaking this open, that we give due attention to something as simple as the necessity of love. Now let's do this, show of hands. How many of you think that the world could use with a little bit more love? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see you guys in Portland as well. Everyone in Portland's like, whoo, everyone online, put those hands up, right? We all agree that the world needs more love in it. And here's the thing, because of who Jesus is, we have access to the most extraordinary love in the world. And as the followers of Jesus, we need to make sure that love is the centerpiece of the ethics by which we live. We need to make sure that at every turn, whether it's upward with God, whether it's the way we view ourselves because of God's love for us, and as we move out into the world, that love is essential and necessary and primary on who we are. Now, what's amazing is, is if you think about that, I know when I've thought about that, I realize all these ways that I don't do a great job loving. And what I love about God is that he knows we're all in process. He knows that none of us have it all together. So I want to call to our remembrance today the necessity of love. Because you could have all the right ingredients in your life, but without a lot of love in it, it's not gonna be an extraordinary life. So in order to unpack this, I wanna unpack this with the most famous passage of the Bible about love, 1 Corinthians 13. Go ahead, open up your Bibles there. You probably, some of you don't even need to open up your Bibles there because you've been to enough weddings, you got this thing memorized. But I want you to go to your Bible there because even if you haven't memorized, I want you to be able to read along. First Corinthians, it's easy to find. If you didn't bring a Bible with you to church, I know some of you uh, didn't do that. Those books on the seats in front of you, all of them are Bibles. They're not phone books. They're not romance novels. I heard that in one of the Bibles, there's a $100 bill at First Corinthians 13. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, everyone's just like, whoa! <laughs> you sinners. 1 Corinthians 13, it's easy to find. In your New Testament, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? And then you have the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. Then you have Paul's letter to the Romans and then 1 Corinthians. So all those books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, all longer books, and then 1 Corinthians. And of course, as you have to say, chapter 13 is between chapters 12 and 14. Just to close in all those loops, I want you to read along. It begins this way. 1 Corinthians 13, 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. So we begin with this reality that love is better. Love is better. All the things listed here in each one of these verses, they're good, but love is better. Now, the Apostle Paul begins by first saying, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, so the idea is, though I have all the eloquence that a human can come up with, though I know all these different languages, even if I know the language of heaven, 
But if I don't speak with love, I become a sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. Now think about that for a second. I mean, even take a moment. Notice here at, on, on our Crossroads Vancouver stage, we have our little house for the drummer. And the reason we give the drummer a house is because we realize that drummers don't have a house unless they marry somebody. <laughs> the, <laughs> every drummer knows exactly what I'm talking about. So, so we got the drummer a house here because we wanted to give the drummer a little sum. And we realized if he didn't have a house, he'd be in trouble. But notice, has anybody here complained about the sound of the cymbal since we gave the drummer a house? No. How many of you complained about the sound of the drums before here at Crossroads? Don't raise your hands. <laughs> See, cymbals are loud, right? I've been playing music my entire life. And when I, as the bass player, I stand right next to the drummer and I have a, a, a ringing that comes in and out of my ears because the overtones of those cymbals are so loud, especially when I was playing, you know, rock and roll and heavy metal and those drummers, like, you know, no sense to hit the drum to make music. You got to slam that thing so the thing goes like this and it, and it, and it, and it sounds crazy. And so, so your ears get all jacked up, right? Now, how many of you like standing next to a cymbal all day long every day? Anybody likes love that? Like, I just want that symbol ringing in my ear 24 hours a day. Some of you do. I bet your spouse feels the same way about you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But listen, if you speak with the greatest eloquence, you have the language of heaven, but you have not love. You are just a headache waiting to happen. That's what this means. So eloquent speech is good. Tongues is good, but love is better. From there, notice what it says. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. See, now what he says, he's like, listen, not only is, 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 is eloquence good, but love is better, but now all sorts of spiritual giftings, prophecy, the ability to understand mysteries, unique supernatural knowledge, even the gift of faith that Jesus said, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, be removed in the sea, it will go. But if you have not love, it says you're nothing. So spiritual gifts are good, but love is better. Wow. This reminds us, of course, 1 Corinthians 8, 1, where it says knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Wow. In a very educated society like ours, love is better. You could be the wisest, most credentialed person in your profession, but if you do not have love, it says, notice, I am nothing. Wow. And then verse three says, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but I have not love, it profits me nothing. Now this speaks of all sorts of sacrifice whether you are exceedingly charitable with, with the resources that you have to help people who are impoverished, even the most ultimate sacrifice for somebody to give up their life for their faith in Jesus. It says, if I have not love, it profits me nothing. See, sacrifice is good, but love is better. This reminds me, Jesus said, John 15, verses 12 and 13, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. And Jesus laid down his life for us. He laid down his life for you. Because Jesus is saying, in a sense, what you need to realize is things are good. We shouldn't neglect eloquence. We shouldn't neglect spiritual giftings. We shouldn't neglect all sorts of sacrificial living. But love is even more important. Now, are we cultivating that? See, it's a, love's a choice that you make. Love is a decision that you make in the moment to be different than what might come naturally. And Jesus' idea for the greatest commandment is I want you to live in what is best or better for your own lives. Now, from there in verse four of 1 Corinthians 13, we learn something really important. That's the fact that love is specific. Love is specific. Why? Because the Apostle Paul defines love. He doesn't want to leave it up to chance. He doesn't want you to think for one second that any idea you have about love is love. He's saying, I want to define it for you. And the love that's being spoken about here, this love that is better is very specific. 
Now I want to read it to you. Look what it says in verse 4. It says, love suffers long, or some of your translations say love is patient and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. Now, this is a kind of a powerful definition of love, isn't it? Now, there's a couple of things that you need to know about this. First, the definition of love is all described using verbs, which speaks of the fact that love is something that you do, right? They're all verbs here. And this is what happens. This is who we become when the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. This specific definition of love, this self-sacrificial love, this love that is not needing to be deserved to be given, but is given proactively, it's the work of the Spirit. That's why the fruit of the Spirit is love. But not only that, these verbs are all in the present continuous tense in the Greek, which denotes actions and attitudes which have become habitual that are completely being repeated over and over again. So what that means is that this love is not something that you understood or practiced in the past. It's something that maybe it great it happened in the past. It has to be happening right now. And I think what happens for us, for many of us, is we can look back on a time when we were really committed to the art of living that's loving, this specific love in the Bible, but now that love has begun to grow cold. Maybe in certain areas of your life right now, that love has been growing cold, where there was a time, maybe on your wedding day, right? I love when I see couples when they're getting married. I always tell people, as a, someone who's officiated many, many weddings, when the bride comes around the corner, I never look at the bride. I always look at the groom because that is the best moment of the entire wedding. When a man is standing there and his eyes see his bride in her wedding gown. And listen, I've never once been at a wedding or officiated a wedding where they didn't say, I'm gonna love you with everything I got for the rest of my life. Never one. Anybody been to a wedding like that? A wedding that, that they don't say that? But then you fast forward like two years or 20 years and all of a sudden what happens? Where is this, I am gonna pursue you with all that I have? See, I can see it in my own life. I love my bride and land. We've been married for 13 years. And as I'm preparing this, I'm like, man, I could look back at a time when I was more passionate to pursue my wife's heart than I am right now. And I'm like, oh, Lord, okay. You need to do a fresh work. Lord, I need to get back to the most important things. And I confess that before you all because I know the same is true for many of us. See, the love that God wants us to have is specific. It's important. Now, and it's something that needs to be practiced today. Now, what's fascinating is Karl Barth was a, is a very well-known theologian. Now, you guys know this. When I quote somebody, it doesn't mean I agree with everything they've ever said. And, you know, it's, we live in a weird day and age where if you quote somebody, everyone thinks, oh, they're agreeing with everything that person ever did, which is nuts. It's just a good quote, right? Karl Barth's brilliant, but I don't agree with everything that Barth uh, stood for. And, but what's fascinating is Karl Barth broke down this passage into three different ways. He said first from verse four to the beginning of verse five that it deals with love and the darkness within ourselves. And then from the middle of verse five and verse six, it deals with love and the darkness in others. And then verses seven and the beginning of verse eight, love and the apparent darkness in God. Now, what's funny is, is years and years ago, I, I wrote this, that, that framework down and I, and, and I see it to be true. First, it's us, and then it's others, and then it's how do we deal with who God is. But you know what I realized just studying it for this message is that Karl Barth broke down this specific definition of love into inward, outward, and upward. Ho, ho, ho. 
So I think if Carl was here today, he'd endorse my book. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know. <laughs> this specific definition of love is powerful. Now, here's what's, po- here's what's really powerful. You guys want some homework to do for the rest of your life? Nobody raised their hands. Okay, so if you're a follower of Jesus, this is your homework for the rest of your life. Okay? I'm going to give it to you right here. I want you to take verses 4 to the beginning of verse 8. And every time you see the word love, I want you to put Jesus' name in there. Check it out. Jesus suffers long. Jesus is kind. Jesus does not envy. Jesus does not parade himself. Jesus is not puffed up. Jesus does not behave rudely. Jesus does not seek his own. Jesus is not provoked. Jesus thinks no evil. Jesus does not rejoice in iniquity, but Jesus rejoices in the truth. Jesus bears all things. Jesus believes all things. Jesus hopes all things. And Jesus endures all things. Jesus never fails. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. That reads like hand in glove, and that is why Jesus is Savior and Lord. And that is why Jesus was an acceptable sacrifice unto his Father for my sins and for your sins. That is why I am more grateful today than on the day that I got saved to say that I believe in Jesus. Because Jesus never fails. And Jesus is so patient, he's so kind, and Jesus doesn't keep records of your wrongs. And Jesus doesn't rejoice in iniquity, but Jesus rejoices in the truth. And that is why Jesus deserves our allegiance and our loyalty. The Bible says that we bow the knee to Jesus. We say, Lord, you are worthy of my praise. You are worthy of my life. And that is why Jesus laid down his life for us. Because when it boils down to the specifics of what true, real love is, Jesus is rock solid. And if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, why would you not want to follow true love? Why not? I mean, what would hold you back from following true love? I know what holds us back. The fact that true love absolutely transforms our lives. And for many of us, we don't want our lives to be transformed. We're nervous that certain things that we like, Jesus is going to ask us to step away from. And you know what I've learned? That's exactly what he does. Because certain things that we like are not right. Certain things that we like are not loving. You know how I know? Remember your homework? Now I want you to put your name in there. Put your name in this definition. Daniel suffers long. (laughs) How many of you guys ever see my impatience at work? Don't raise your hands. Just pray for me. You know, I'm a right now guy. Like, come on, let's go do this thing. If something takes too long, I'm like, well, you get going. Come on, we got time. We got no time. Right? I have all the reasons why. Daniel is kind. Uh, you haven't seen me before coffee in the morning. <laughs> Nothing funnier when, when I'm making coffee. If I, if, I, when I, if I see either Lynn or the kids and they're like, morning. I'm like, you know, it's good to see you. <laughs> right? Now, You put your name in. I mean, some of you are incredibly patient and some of you are incredibly kind. So maybe you make it through the first two characteristics. (laughs) But by the time you read the list, you realize that all of us fall short of this standard, this, this specific definition. And my friends, that's the point. That's the point of the gospel. The point of the gospel is that when true love is the standard, when pure, self-sacrificial, life-giving love with no expectation of anything in return is the standard, all of us fall short in some way. How many of you ever kept records of wrongs for someone you love? Like they got something wrong and you're not gonna let them live it down. Right? It, like isn't, no, yeah, Okay. We'll move past that. I know I can, I, can, I can work this one for hours, you know what I mean? Because we all have that. But then it says love doesn't keep records of wrongs. How many times have we behaved rudely? Just didn't respond the right way. See, Jesus' love is specific and God is interested in transforming us from 
our failed attempts at love to become more and more conformed to his love. And that's why the fruit of the Spirit is love. Because the Spirit of God, as he dwells in the life of a believer, begins to cultivate an environment where the love of God is the first response. But it's not there naturally. It's because of the the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And that's why believing in Jesus, when we put our faith and trust in him, we are justified, which means we were guilty, but now we're not guilty. We were outside of God's family, and now we're inside God's family. And at the moment a person puts their faith and trust in Jesus, then the Spirit of God takes up residence in their life and begins to change the entire environment internally in a person because of the Spirit's presence. And now all of a sudden these shoots of fruit of love starts to boil up in our lives. No sermon on love is going to make us love as Jesus loved. Only the spirit of God who came because of Jesus' love will do that. And if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do it by the end of this gathering. And listen, I want to tell you, you should run into the arms of Jesus because the 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 love that you deeply long for will never be found in a person who you're attracted to or or, or this thing that you've always wanted that you're like, when I get that, then I'll really know love. No, it's in Jesus. It's in Jesus. And and listen to what it says. Paul ends great Romans chapter 8. Verses 37 to 39, this way. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. What that means, what that means is that God, no matter what happens, nothing can sever you from the love of God because through the finished work of Jesus, you are umbilically connected to his love. Nothing can separate you. No angel, no demon, no height, nor death, nothing in the past, nothing in the present, nothing in the future, nothing can separate you from God's love because no one can pull you out of his hand. And that is the good news of the gospel, my friends. That's the best news ever. You know, when, 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 when love starts to reach a person's heart, all of a sudden their life changes. They become obsessed with this love. They're always th- they're, they're Facebook stalking people and, you know, and they're wait- looking at their phone. Is the text coming in? Is the text coming in? And you're, you're waiting for the next thing. And that's the way we should be with Jesus. Amen where we're just so enraptured by this love that he has for us, this love that would cause him to lay down his life for us. But not only is love better, not only is love specific, but look what it says. After it says, love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. And whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part will be done away with. When I was a child... I spoke as a child, verse 11. I understood as a child and I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly and then face to face. Now I know in part and then I shall know just as I am known. What this teaches us is that love is eternal. See, all these other things that are listed here, they're all good things. But none of them are eternal things. See, he already used ideas of spiritual giftings, tongues, all these things in verses 1 and 2. And then he comes back to them. Whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Knowledge, it's going to vanish away. Now, before I move on this, because some pastors want to take these verses to mean that the gifts of the Spirit don't work today. My friends, that is not what this means at all. Don't, like, and these are people who, like, some of the pastors who, who espouse this view, they love God, they love the Bible, they're very serious about the Bible, but it completely misses the point of what this is talking about. What it's saying is that prophecies are for here and now. Tongues are for here and now. Knowledge, this is for here and now. And there's a time when that stuff's not going to be necessary because when Jesus returns, when we know as we are known, then all there will be is the love of God, that agape of God. And all these other things, like, it's not like we're going to be having afterglow sessions in heaven with the Lord. Like, we're all going to be waiting around for like, oh, listen, that glory that, you know, that, 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 that tongue just got spoken. It's like, man, we're going to be in the presence of God 
in totality. Those things will cease because God will be all in all. These are temporary measures for this side of eternity. But really what this is saying, it's emphasizing once again that God's love is the most important thing. And us walking in this love, that's why I call the art of living is loving. Because if each one of us walk away today and say, I want my experience of God's love upward and me returning that love to him, I want to love God more. I want to experience more of God's love. And then because of God's love that he loves me, I want to learn how to love myself more. And if you say, and I want to learn how to love everybody else around me more, then to me, this is the most important message you'll ever hear. The book breaks open how to cultivate upward, inward, and outward love. I'm going to be, over the next three weeks, I'm going to be taking one for upward, one for inward, one for outward, just to give you a little tease and a taste of it. But the beauty is, is Paul links this love to to maturity. Notice what he says in these verses, in verse 11. When I was, to move back to verse 10, and when, and when that which is perfect has come, or that which is complete or fully mature has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now listen, I love my kids, but my kids are childish. And they're supposed to be, God bless them. You know what I mean? But it's like, like when I look at my little Annabelle, so she's three, and I look at Maranatha, and she's nine. I look at Obadiah, when he's 12, when they're being childish, I realize that that's a temporary condition. And I say, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I say, oh, praise God. Like, like Annabelle's in that age right now where she just wants to take everything out. And once she takes everything out, her purpose is done. <laughs> and no matter how much I say, Anna, but why don't you clean up all this stuff? Why? Now, I know some of you are still in that stage where like your, that's, your house looks like bomb hit it and that's how you live and that's praise God. But we're hoping that our kids are gonna make their way out of that thing because there's nothing worse than when you step on a Lego. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> Those of you who don't have kids yet, you wait till you step on your first set of Legos. We'll see how long-suffering you are. <laughs> I was going to be the kindest dad ever. I stepped on a leg, you know. I was like, uh, what was his name? Yosemite Sam. Suffering succotash, you know. That's, that was me. But you know that the, this childlikeness, this childishness is temporary. But we always have to remember that God's love is meant to be experienced for us like children. It's 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. It says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. I love that verse. What manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. And, th and then he says, and the world does not yet know what we're going to be because it hasn't reached its culmination yet. So, so we learn here that love is better than really good things. Love is specific. It's uniquely defined. And that love is eternal. That so many of the things that we have a tendency to focus on right now are temporary. But we should focus on the biggest ideas, the most important thing. And then 1 Corinthians 13 ends with the, one of the most famous verses in the Bible. Where it says, And now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. So we end with this reality that love is the greatest. These triplets of Christian piety, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is, is love. Think about how powerful that is for a second. I mean, we know that faith is what saves us. The ability to trust God as we move through, it's essential to how we make our decisions, right? 
You think of hope. God has spoken of as the God of all hope. See, it's the ability to look forward into life with joy, knowing that our future is in the hands of God. I mean, you think some of you right now, your faith is languishing because you're not choosing to trust the faithful God. You're worried about tomorrow or you're worried about your circumstances, not knowing that your father is good. In Jesus, he's bestowed amazing love on you and that you're his child and he's got you. Hope, being able to look down the road of life. I like to say hope, H-O-P-E, having only positive expectations. Does that mean that everything's going to go on exactly the way you think it's going to go on in the future? No. It means that no matter what goes on, God's going to be with you. And because God is with you, it's good. That's what hope is. Hope is being able to live today, hoping and knowing tomorrow, because God is God, is going to be good. And faith is essential and hope is essential but love occupies that supreme place. God is love. And it reminds me of the other most famous Bible verse next to abide these three faith, hope and love, and the greatest of these is love. And that's John three sixteen. That for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. Why did Jesus come? Because God so loved the world. Jesus came on a rescue mission that is rooted in God's love. And Jesus knows that all of us, every single one of us have made mistakes, all sorts of mistakes, some huge mistakes and other ones slight mistakes, some mistakes that we made because we felt like being rebels and other times because we didn't even know that what we were doing is wrong. God knows that about us and he still says, I'm, because of my love for you, I'm gonna take care of you. Because of my love for you, I'm gonna send my son who's gonna live perfectly, who's gonna, with the specific definition of love, he's gonna live it to the T and because of that, he is gonna be a perfect, spotless, sinless sacrifice who is worthy to be sacrificed on the cross in accordance with all of the Jewish sacrificial system to conquer sin once for all. See, the reason the art of living is loving for you and for me is because God loves you because God is love and God wants us to learn how to walk in that love. And the only way a person can truly experience the love of God is by putting their faith in Jesus. And I believe that there are many of you who are here today. You've never said yes to Jesus before. And you're hearing this message and you're saying, I wanna know that love. You're saying to yourself, I want to walk in love. And I want to learn this art of loving upward, inward, and outward. I want my life not just to have the right ingredients, but I want my life to be extraordinary because it is filled with the amazing, incomprehensible love of God. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus in just a moment. But listen, for those of you who are already followers of Jesus, listen to me. God wants us to love more radically more reckless, recklessly and more profoundly than we ever had. As the world continues on its course, it's so easy for us not to respond with love, but to respond with anger and frustration. But that is not what God has done. When the world was lost, God sent his son because of God's great love so that anyone who would believe in him would come back. Christian brother, Christian sister, my family, listen. We need to love now more than we ever have. We need to love more passionately and recklessly than we ever have. Not with the, some, 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 some not defined love, but with this specific love, this agape, this love that God has for us. And I pray that we would all say, Lord, will you grow, expand my heart that I might receive more of your love and return to you living upward. And that because of your love, that I would love myself through the lens of the cross of Jesus Christ. That I might really love myself, that I might love my neighbor, everybody. The world needs this today. And I believe God, by his spirit, is driving us to love. 
Can I get an amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads and our hearts as we pray together.